of the state of West Virginia, Jim Justice, announced last week that he will not do a debate during his campaign run for U.S. Senate, the seat currently held by Senator Joe Manchin. Uh, that was met with some disappointment by a few folks, not the least of which I'm sure is his, uh, one of his opponents from the Democratic Party, Glenn Elliott, who joins us via telephone this morning. Glenn, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. It is great to be with you, Rob. Did you know that announcement was coming, Glenn, or were you anticipating that there would be at least one and maybe more debates between you and Governor Justice before Election Day? Uh, we had asked for a debate for a while. Um, it doesn't surprise me that he uh, said no to a debate. I um, you know, I know if you listen to him, he believes that, uh, you know, he's going to win this race going away, which he says. So, um, you know, it doesn't surprise me. I think it's disappointing. Uh, he talks a lot about uh, caring about the voters and the people of West Virginia. Well, I think, you know, voters deserve a chance just to see their candidates uh, discuss the issues one for one and, and you know, at, you know, on stage together. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think voters appreciate people who take their votes for granted. And I think, you know, voters appreciate people to show up and, and I really think um, it's a missed opportunity, uh, but, you know, obviously uh, the, uh, my campaign's not going to uh, change what it's doing, and we are still in this campaign to win it. I know I know a lot of you in the media don't uh, see much of a chance for anyone on the Democratic side in these statewide races, but uh, 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 really uh, uh, I've been to all 55 counties once. Uh, I'm making my second round through now talking to people everywhere, and there's a lot of disappointment uh, for folks, um, you know, with the way the state's been run. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for Democrats to really pick up some key races. And I'm certainly I'm certainly acting as though I'm going to do that in this one. The governor has a lot of issues, uh, much publicized with finances, be they his yeah. or companies run by yeah. his children. Is any of that resonating with the people you speak with when you travel to 55 counties? It certainly um, it is more now than it was over the summer when I started knocking on people's doors. Um, it hasn't gotten the traction yet that you would think. Um, you know, clearly, um, 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 you know, there's an image of the governor that a lot of people have, and then there's the actual actual person that, that some people know. And you talk to people in in some of the southern counties, especially, uh, you know, in Greenbrier County where he calls home, and and they know him down there pretty well. So a lot of these stories have resonated with them. And they, But uh, for the rest of the state, you know, people just see a guy who who goes on TV for press conferences and and says a lot of platitudes without much substance, and he says it in a very folksy way, and then he'll, he'll mention his dog or bring his dog with him, and that's the guy they see. So, you know, my challenge is to get more people – uh, you know, to see the real Jim Justice, the person who doesn't pay his bills, doesn't uh, pay his taxes, who who literally takes money out of his employees' paychecks and uses it for something that's not for them instead of their health insurance premiums. And then, uh, you know, my other challenge is getting more people to know who I am. Uh, you know, I don't have universal name recognition by any chance. So, uh, you know, that's been my uh, one of the reasons that we've been taking this campaign as wide and far as we can just to get my name recognition up. And and hopefully that by election day, you know, our different paths. I think the governor's on a downward trajectory, and I'm on an upward one. And, and my challenge is to get those paths to intersect uh, before voting begins. Do you see a chance the governor will change his mind in regards to a debate with you? I would, uh, I would be shocked if he would. Um, quite frankly, I don't think he wants to, uh, you know, have to answer a lot of questions. Uh, he's shown a disdain for, uh, you know, answering questions from the media. Uh, uh, by keeping people excluded from his weekly press conferences. And I don't think he wants to actually talk about his personal issues or his uh, business issues. And quite frankly, I don't think he's prepared to talk about a lot of the federal issues he would have to address if he were a senator. Uh, you know, he's not been a, a, you know, in the details policy type of guy as governor. He hasn't really been in the in the sausage making part of, you know, making legislation. He's been pretty much a hands off governor. And being a senator, uh, you're expected to actually uh, you know, get into that sausage making process and uh, be into the details a little bit. I don't think he has that capability. I don't think he's familiar with uh, federal issues. I'm, I doubt he could, uh, uh, you know, talk in great detail or or specificity on constitutional subjects. So, you know, for him, uh, you know, I don't blame him for not getting a debate. I wouldn't want to debate me on those issues. I I've got a pretty good grasp of of all the issues on the table, and uh, you know, I certainly think um, a, a debate would show. 
uh, the great disparity in our understanding of these issues. And Glenn, I know you've done a few interviews with us, but the audience is always turning over and changing. So if you don't mind, sure. recap your background so that uh, your claim there about having some familiarity uh, has some yeah. uh, backing to it. Uh, certainly. Um, you know, born, born and raised in, in Wheeling. That's my hometown. Uh, I went away to college and then landed a, a um, an incredible opportunity working for Senator Byrd. It was my first job out of college in the 1990s. Worked with him for five years before I went to law school and I really learned a lot uh, from him. Learned, well, got to see the way he went about the job of being a senator in the, in the same Senate seat that I am now seeking and uh, really developed an appreciation for the way he used that state, uh, that seat to help our state. Uh, it's kind of special now driving around the state, you know, 30 something years later, seeing all the roads and bridges and buildings named after him for all the work that he, he did there. Um, uh, but then I uh, went on to law school, uh, worked at a law firm for a while before moving home to Wheeling in, uh, in 2009, just to I sort of try something new. I kind of burn out in the practice of law and moved back home, ran for mayor. And in 2016, got reelected in 2020. And uh, for folks who've been to Wheeling lately, uh, you're going to see a city in West Virginia that is full of construction right now. Uh, cranes and, and contractors and orange cones everywhere. Uh, Wheeling is really a city uh, making a dramatic comeback, and I'm very proud of my role in that. It wasn't just me. There was a lot of things going on there. But, um, you know, Wheeling is a city um, – uh, that we'll be reckoned with here in a couple of years. I have, I have no doubt about that. I left office after my second term on June 30th. I couldn't uh, run for a third under our city charter and decided to get in this race when Senator Manchin uh, 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 stepped out. I'd work with both the Senators Manchin and Capito in my capacity as mayor, and I know very well what cities need, and I think that's something that also separates me from the governor is just knowing what the communities need across our state. You know, we have a lot of cities that are just looking for that little bit of help to – uh, sort of turn the corner and stop, you know, uh, stop exporting young people, which is what we've become so good at as a state. And I have a pretty good feel for, I think, what the issues are, uh, you know, what the senator or uh, what the person in the Senate seat needs to do to really help, help our communities move forward. Matt Miller. I hear you talk about uh, uh, what is going on in Wheeling. And, and at the same time, my first thought, because I'm a sports guy, was, sure. oh, the city just lost the Super 6 football championships <laughs> from the WVSSAC. And I, I think that's sad because uh, and I've, I've always heard uh, such great things about how the teams were treated. And, uh, you know, like professional athletes, the locker rooms and, and the uniforms pressed and ready to go. And so uh, the, the invitation of the fans coming in, I know many times that I was up there uh, – you all did a, a top-notch job of hosting that type of event. Yeah, well, and that's a sore subject between me and uh, Mayor Amy Goodwin, uh, who also is from Wheeling, though she currently resides in Charleston. Uh, a, a couple years ago, we were able to secure to get the MEC, the uh, Mountain East uh, Conference Men's and Women's Basketball Tournament, to come from Charleston to make Wheeling its permanent home. And uh, that was, I guess, their revenge. Uh, Charleston got the Super 6 back. But, look, it was, uh, uh, we had it for 30 years. Um, I do, it was a big economic driver in the city, um, but a lot of folks, I think, got tired of making that trip to Wheeling. One thing, the folks in the – well, you guys are in the eastern panhandle, but us in the northern panhandle, uh, you know, this uh, a statewide trip uh, – uh, this statewide campaign for me has reminded me how far Wheeling is from everything. <laughs> uh, we're not really close to anywhere. Everywhere I get in the car, it's, it's a three- or four-hour drive, and I think, you know, that probably – uh, had something to do with getting it back to a more central location. But uh, we certainly enjoy having that tournament in Wheeling. Glenn, you mentioned earlier that uh, there are a lot of folks, especially in the media, that say with where West Virginia is right now as a state in its voting record and so forth, it's hard for a Democrat to win. And yet uh, we, we saw Joe Manchin as a Democrat uh, who was able to uh, steadily win because of what he stood for. And I know the Democratic Party in this day and age, especially on the national level, has, has kind of gone farther in one direction than, than staying maybe as a moderate. How would you describe yourself as a, a candidate uh, on the Democratic side and, and where you stand, would you be more like a Joe Manchin? Well, certainly, uh, Senator Manchin has certainly uh, proved that you can win in the state with a D next to your name over the years. Um, you know, I don't agree with the Senator on every issue, you know, uh, issue by issue. One thing that I, I, I do share with Senator Manchin and with Senator Byrd before him is that I don't uh, think the role of a senator is to take marching orders from your party at the national level. Um, or from your president. I think that's one big thing that would uh, distinguish me from Governor Justice. I don't think you'll find any daylight between him 
and former President Trump. Uh, you know, he'll do whatever he is told to do in those respects. And I'm not afraid to stand up to the president. Um, president Biden, in my opinion, made a big mistake earlier this year um, when the Cleveland Close Factory closed down in Weirton because of of, of some dumping of uh, tin into our markets by China and by Canada and by Germany, uh, the Biden administration could have over t- overturned the decision by the International Trade Commission and actually um, imposed a, 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 some tariffs on that dumping coming in and to save that factory. Well, they didn't, and I was very, very critical of them. I think you know you need to have, uh, you know, I'm all for I'm all for fair trade and free trade, but it has to be fair and. Uh, clearly, in that situation, the administration was being too concerned about inflationary pressures, and they didn't act. Now, fortunately, uh, Cleveland Cliffs is going to be, um, you know, having another use, so that's a that's a good outcome there. But at the end of the day, I think uh, that's something where uh, you have to look at our trade policies and make sure that you're not, um, you know, trading in an un- uh, trading unfairly, and that countries uh, basically aren't. Uh, dumping products into our market at unfair rates, and that's something I would disagree with. I think my party on, you know, I don't agree. With, uh, I won't uh, defend the way the Biden administration handled the border for at least the first three and a half years of of the president. I think we need to have a strong and secure border, and I was glad to see the uh, president agree to uh, sign a bill that was negotiated in the Senate by uh, uh, by Senator Lankford and by Senator Manchin. Unfortunately, uh, the Republicans walked away from that bill, and I think that. Uh, because they wanted the issue more than they wanted the actual solution. And, um, you know, that is a big difference. But I'm not afraid to stand up my party where, where I think they're wrong. I recognize the Democratic brand in this state is is somewhat damaged. Um, but, I, I, you know, it, it, if you look at the voters, uh, uh, voter registration is 40 percent Republican, 30 percent Democratic, and 25 percent independent. And that's the fastest growing group right there is independents. And I've knocked on a lot of independent doors and to think that they are are going to be lock, stock, and barrel with the Republican Party um, is, a, is a mistake. Now, many of them are going to vote for former President Trump, and I think that is baked in pretty fairly. Uh, but uh, they do not have that same loyalty or fealty to any of the other Republican candidates, especially not Governor Justice, uh, uh, given some of the issues that he's had with just you know basically uh, paying his bills and paying his taxes. That certainly rubs some Republicans the wrong way and some independents the wrong way. You mentioned earlier as well um, um, being able to work with Senator Byrd back in the day. I know that had to be a tremendous experience and certainly something you can draw from, but how different do you see the workings in Washington, D.C. now compared to then? Um, well, yeah, and that's one of the sadder things when you look at where our country is. You know, I was there in the 90s when things were starting to on their current trajectory, especially after uh, uh, the Republican takeover in 1994. You saw a brand of politics began to infect the Senate, too, that was uh, not necessarily, um, you know, what you want to see. But back in the 90s when I worked there, uh, you know, you would have your fights during the day. And then, you know, members of Congress and Senate, and including members of staff, would go out and have beers later all all at the same places and all talk to each other. And it was, you know, you, you fought during, uh, during the day, but you didn't hate each other. Um, you know, now... If, uh, I talked to my friends who, who still work in D.C., and there's uh, Republican bars and there's Democratic bars, and they don't really talk to each other. Uh, the Senate work week is also shortened considerably. Uh, uh, senators are basically only in town from Tuesday at noon till Thursday at noon. Uh, they're back in their districts the rest of the time raising money. Um, they're do- and, you know, what? Uh, the outcome of that is they never really get to know each other. Uh, Bird had friendships across the aisle. Uh, his best friend was probably Ted Stevens, a, a pretty cranky, a very con- con- uh, conservative senator from Alaska. His best friend on the Democratic side was probably the most liberal one, Ted Kennedy. Uh, Bird didn't have much in common politically with either of those two men, uh, but he re- uh, built great friendships with them. And you've seen Senator Manchin try to make the same approach to have friendships across the spectrum. But that is the exception today, not the rule. Uh, they get in the bubbles. They get in their own caucus. Uh, they come in town for a couple days to uh, for all their votes, uh, but they never break bread with members of, uh, you know, across the aisle. Uh, they never get to know their families, and it's so much easier to uh, to throw grenades at somebody on the Senate floor when you've never had a meal with them or or a beer or whatever your uh, your recreational choice is. Uh, if you don't really know somebody, it's much easier to stand there and demonize them and and suggest they don't love America. Um, you know, that's what we have to get back to where we actually, you know, all, all recognize we're all on the same team. We just have very different views about where we want to get to. But um, you know, that's what I would like to see. You know, uh, uh, my approach to the Senate would 
it would be one of a hundred at least trying to get back to some sense of normalcy to where we don't hate each other, uh, where we can agree or where we can disagree but still be very agreeable in that process. Bill's double field. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Glenn. As an aside, I'm looking at some of your campaign literature, and I'm looking at a picture of you and Senator Byrd. I cannot believe anybody looks so young as what you did in that <laughs> photograph. <laughs> yeah. Hey. yeah, it's about 30-something years ago, uh, Bill, but uh, I can't believe how much older I look now, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. Now, I did not say that. I said it the other way around. <laughs> hey, uh, Glenn, at an earlier time, earlier uh, appearance on the show, you made the comment that uh, you thought the success of Senator Byrd, Senator Capito, and Senator Manchin was the fact they were so engaged, engaged yep. with uh, uh, members of their party, engaged with the uh, the folks in the other party, and engaged with the residents of the uh, state itself. Um, and I had anticipated that you would make this as one of your campaign thrusts. Have you done so? Oh, certainly. Uh, I mean, every time we oh, we talk about, uh, you know, the races, uh, these races are comparisons. And um, um, if you look at the way I've I've approached the job, if, it, if you look at the model that I've talked about in terms of, you know, working with Bird and working uh, with Senator Manchin over the years, um, it's all about showing up to work and putting in the effort. That's the way you're an effective senator. And I think, um, you know, uh, uh, the governor has a very different approach to his public service. He's basically been a stay-at-home governor. He shows up for the press conferences and, the, and you know, to have, um, you know, uh, ribbon cuttings and groundbreakings, he's always there for that. But he, you know, he hasn't made, uh, you know, going to Charleston to meet with the legislature a priority. He doesn't even meet that often with members of his own party, let alone the Democrats. Uh, he has a supermajority Republican legislature, and he has – he can't convince them to actually do another 5% tax cut right now. Um, and that shows you that, you know, folks just like, he's not made the effort to get to build those relationships of where you can get stuff done that well. Um, you know, bird and mansion and capital all put in the effort and they've all, if you look at all of their careers, uh, have bipartisan accomplishments. Uh, uh, you know, governor justice is just not wired that way. You know, he, uh, he's pretty much been governor from his couch in Lewisburg, except for the photo ops. You cannot be a senator from Lewisburg. It's just it doesn't work that way. You have to go there. You have to physically be there to vote. Uh, you have to get on the right committees and put the work in. The Senate is – when you're a senator, you're one of 100. You're not the center of the conversation like you are when you're governor. Uh, you're, senator, you're one of 100, and probably 90 of them think they should be president. So you're dealing with a lot of egos. Um, the notion that you're going to go there and just show up and you know make a big splash without putting in the work is is not a – it's just not realistic. That's not the way the Senate works. Um, you have to go there and put in the work to build some respect, and ideally you have to be there long enough uh, uh, to get reelected so you can build some sen uh, seniority to start bringing back resources. I don't see Governor Justice even serving a full six-year term, um, uh, let alone you know getting uh, being there long enough to be in a position like Senator Manchin and Burr before him uh, to bring resources back to West Virginia. Glenn, are you getting support from the uh, National Democratic Office at all in your uh, program uh, for your for your senatorial run? Uh, very, uh, uh, very little support, and no financial support from the National Democratic Party at all. And uh, and you know, um, uh, you know, they're focused on some of the races in the in the so-called swing states, and they want to you know like go after the Ted Cruz's and the Rick Scotts out there. Um, I've made the case to them. I think that's a mistake, uh, just given the fact that West Virginia's media market is a fraction of of Texas or Florida's, and that a few million dollars in this state would go a lot further uh, than uh, would in those bigger states. Uh, but uh, so far, you know, they haven't seen that interest. But that's fine. Uh, you know, I'm not looking to them for help. It'd be great if they get, if it came. Uh, but if I can win this race without their help, it certainly. Uh, I will, uh, you know, make me even more independent than I am already. Um, you know, I, um, at the end of the day, um, I think a lot of the media state and national media has just written off West Virginia. And I think that's a big mistake. Uh, you know, I don't think anyone's talked to more West Virginians at the doorstep over the last three months than I have. I don't think anyone else has been to all 55 counties at, 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 uh, talking to people in town halls and really having their finger on the pulse of where this state is. It's a mistake to think of this state as a, as a ruby red Republican state, it is a a lot of people. I got frustrated with Democrats. I, uh, I definitely support President Trump, 
Uh, but a lot of folks are just kind of like attuned off to both parties right now. And, you know, I think the last thing they want is someone who approaches this position uh, from one of arrogance and says that the race is over um, about before a single vote has been passed. And I think, you know, what I'm counting on is just convincing enough West Virginia voters um, that I'm a, a, a very viable alternative for a very important seat. And, uh, you know, we'll see where it goes. But I'm not expecting much help. Uh, back to your question from the National Party, and that's okay. I don't need it. We have about two minutes left. Yeah. Did you have a final question yeah. for Glenn, Bill? You also mentioned uh, uh, Florida and Texas, uh, Scott and, uh, and Cruz. It's my understanding yeah. very little the national money is going to those campaigns either. So it puzzles me a little bit where uh, uh, races that might be won uh, are not being supported by the, uh, the national office. Yeah, well uh, – uh, um, you know, I hate to be too critical of folks in the National Party because they're doing what they think is best. But there was a movie out a couple of years ago called Moneyball, and I don't know if you're familiar with that movie about you know a baseball manager who who didn't go for the flashy uh, players who hit the most home runs, but just basically looked at statistics and you know the most uh, the way to get the most out of your money. I really think if the National Democratic Party looked at these races strategically and looked at the size of the TV markets. And look at the history. West Virginia voted for Democrats for a long time until very recently. Um, so it's not like there aren't people who haven't ever voted for Democrats before. Um, you know, they, if they were looking at this race, I really think objectively and strategically, I think they'd realize it's a lot closer than people might think. Um, but, you know, sometimes uh, folks just lack that imagination. Um, you know, I'm certainly – I'm going about this race as though I am I'm very much uh, – you know, I very much can win it. And, you know, we'll see. I could be wrong. And, uh, you know, I could lose by a lot on, on Election Day. We shall see. Uh, but I'm, I, uh, the governor and I have one thing in common. That's we both never lost an election. So I'm not planning on this being my first. Glenn, great to speak with you this morning. Appreciate your time. Best of luck to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Rob. Have a good day. And thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, thanks. Best of luck, Glenn.